who hasn't heard the songs, the house of the rising sun, we got to get out of this place, don't let me be misunderstood. These songs were just a few hit singles performed by British rock band The Animals. The band was formed in Newcastle upon Tyne in the early 1960s and they balance tough rock edged pop against heavy sounds of rhythm and blues. I got the chance to meet up with drummer John Steele for a talk at Hotel Kullaberg in the seaside resort town Mölle in Sweden where the animals performed just recently. John Steele is the original drummer of the band. We started by looking back at his first musical memories. Here's a clip. Uh, yeah, um, my first musical memories were um, at, at my home. Uh, I was uh, the youngest of four children, <clears throat> my two sisters and brother uh, all, played, uh, all played records. Uh, my sisters liked musicals, so I got a lot of show tunes. My brother, <clears throat> he liked jazz, uh, original Dixieland jazz and some swing. So I was listening, from an early age, I was listening to his collection of Fats Waller and Louis Armstrong, uh, Benny Goodman, uh, Woody Herman, lots of things like that, uh, which, which inspired me to, um, to want to to want to play music. So I took up um, playing trumpet. Because back then, in the early 50s, before rock and roll, the, uh, the dance music for young people was jazz, you know. <clears throat> and uh, I was in, I was taken by, taken up with the trumpet um, because of, like Louis Armstrong, Big Spiderbeck, people like that. <clears throat> and so, by the time I was uh, 15, um, I met Eric Burden. We, we were our first, uh, first year class. We dropped out of school and went to an uh, art college. <clears throat> and um, that's where I met Eric. And he, uh, he had some friends in a little, a little Dixieland band. And um, he asked me to join them. So we, we, we got together and had to, uh, a little practice in, in one of the guys' houses. So it was a, <coughs> the lineup was <laughs> a drums, banjo, um, trombone, Eric Burden on trombone. Not something you want to listen to very much. <laughs> and me on trumpet. Um, it only lasted a, uh, a short while because by that time, rock and roll and you know, was was suddenly the the music of the youth, and um, Eric decided he wanted to be to play that kind of music, and he wanted to sing. So <clears throat> the uh, the banjo player said, "Okay, I'll give it an electric guitar." And the drummer he said, "Well, I, I think I want to switch to this new instrument was bass, electric bass guitar, you know." So I said, "Okay, I'll play drums then." <laughs> so that's how that's how I switched to playing drums. Um, how did you learn to play the drums? I, I was self-taught. I did take some lessons um, later on, but at the beginning, um, I just found I could play naturally. You know, it was uh, was something I didn't have any problems with. <clears throat> so that eventually uh, developed. That was be nineteen fifty. Seven, I think, when we first started playing you know, rock music. And then um, by the time we got to the late 50s, 1959, uh, we found a, a, a keyboard player called Alan Price. <clears throat> it was very good. <clears throat> we were playing in a little church hall, and uh, the other band, there were two bands, <coughs> and this kid from, from the other band, he was playing guitar actually, but um, when we started to play, he, he came over and said, can I, can I take, come in with you on piano, you know? So he said, yeah, sure. And he was, he was so good. 
two-handed player, you know. Uh, so that really became the foundation of what was to become, you know, the animal, the Salem Prize, Eric Burden and me. <coughs> Uh, Did he have like this Hammond organ from the start? No, no, no. It was um, this was just a, a church hall, you know, and it had an upright, upright piano in the corner. So he just played on that. Brilliant. And then um, <clears throat> we used to have to depend on venues to have a piano, you know. <laughs> I mean, these were, these were primitive days, and. Um, but he eventually, uh, he, he soon got a, a small electric keyboard. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> shortly after that, there was an instrument that came on the market called, um, uh, wow, what's, uh, oh, dear me. <clears throat> I just talked about it last night with, with the boys. It, uh, but it was the first portable, really portable, uh, keyboard. Ele ele electric keyboard, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Not one of those Vox. <coughs> Vox, the Vox Continental. Mm -hmm. That was it. Um, and so he, he bought one of those. And that's what we used pretty much for uh, most of the early recordings. You know, House of the Rising Sun was done on that. Uh, <coughs> Hammonds were big, bulky things that, you know, you had to have Leslie speakers and. Super happy. Yeah. So, but the, the the Vox Continental was very portable. So um, that was what we that was what we used. And um, <coughs> like I say, we recorded the, the early singles on on that. Uh, by which time we had <coughs> uh, formed the the group that became the Animals. We met uh, Chas Chandler, played bass, and Hilton Valentine. We all came from the roughly the same area. <coughs> at Tyneside, and um, there were other bands that, that we played in, but um, it wasn't until we finally got uh, Hilton on guitar that that became the, the five original animals, you know. That was uh, 19, uh, 1963, and um, we were we were the house band. We were we had a permanent uh, few gigs at a, at a club called the Club of Go Go in Newcastle, which was owned by a, an ex student from Newcastle College, King's College, and uh, <clears throat> he became a sort of an entrepreneur. He opened, he opened the first coffee bar in Newcastle, and then he opened a, <clears throat> a club called the the Downbeat, which was just a an old warehouse painted black and. We played there, and then um, the coffee bar uh, burnt down conveniently because um, the, the insurance money enabled Mike Mike Jeffries, as our guy, the manager, uh, he he invested in a property in the centre of Newcastle and called the Club Club Gogo Club Gogo, which had two rooms. Was a jazz lounge, jazz lounge and a young set, and we we played the. Uh, it started off jazz, but it soon became rhythm and blues and rock and roll, and uh, we, we we became the sort of house band. We played there uh, five nights a week, um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, uh, that's what that, that well, well soon after that um, we were. Um, one of the guests that played there was a guy called um, Graham Bond. You ever hear of Graham Bond? He was there, and that, uh, he played Hammond, Hammond organ. He was a jazz player a bit originally, played alto sax, but uh, and then he was playing Hammond organ uh, with uh, Ginger Baker on drums, Jack Bruce on bass guitar, and Dick Hexel Smith on tenor sax. And they were they were we we just played a support spot. For them to and then they played and then um when we were <coughs> when we were starting for our set at the end of the evening graham said can i can i play with you you know and he got out this uh aldo sax started blowing away jamming with us you know and uh he uh he recognized the potential of the band straight away uh, like i said this was like 1963 and everything was ha happening by that time the beatles had 
already kicked the door down for, you know, for the America and everywhere. And Graham said to Mike Jeffries, who, who, who was the manager, the owner of the club, he said, these guys should be in London, you know. And Mike said, oh, yeah, really? <laughs> this sounds good. He says, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, <clears throat> I can set up some uh, connections with you, you know. So <clears throat> he did uh, exactly that. Uh, at, at this point, we were called the Alan Price Rhythm and Blues Combo, which is a very clumsy name. Because uh, we'd, we'd, we'd been called the Pagans, and then we were called the uh, Kansas City Five, then the Kansas City Seven. Um, when we broke up, and, re and Alan reformed the band again and, and called it the Alan Price Rhythm and Blues Combo. <clears throat> so that's where we were. But um, Graham introduced Mike. He went to, in t t to London, and he was uh, he was introduced to Giorgio Gomolski, <coughs> who was managing the, the Yardbirds at that time, and also a guy called um, Ronan O'Reilly, who later set up the first pirate radio station on a on a on a ship off offshore, because the only radio was BBC radio, you know. <clears throat> so they're really good connections. Um, so Mike Jeffries came back to from London, and um, he said to us, "We've got a great deal. Um, we're, going to, we're going to go down to London. Georgia Gomolski's band is the Yardbirds. They're going to come up here, and we're going to do a swap. They're going to do your gigs here, and we'll, we'll go down and play in London." Uh, and he said, "By the way." Um, Graham made a suggestion that the name isn't very good because uh, you know it should, it should be something like the Beatles. Or, and, and Graham, and Graham said, uh, suggested a name. So Mike said, "Okay." He said, "By the way, you're, you're now going to be called the Animals." <laughs> why? Do you know why? It was just Graham Bond's idea, you know. He just said you need a better name than mm -hmm. Alan Bryce rhythm and blues combo, which was very true because, like I say, it doesn't exactly trip off the tongue, you know. So Graham suggested it, and we said, "Oh, cool, we'll do that." We're called the Animals now. Alan didn't like it too much. <laughs> <laughs> One of the biggest influences on on my generation when we were teenagers, maybe fifteen years old, or what, was. Um, Elvis Presley released a song called Heartbreak Hotel, which was absolutely like nothing else had happened before. It was so totally different. It, um, Do you recall the first time you heard it? It, it was just, you know, I heard it on the radio, I guess, but it, it, it just captured my generation's interest, you know. And the other important um, record at the same time, the same time of year, was uh, a, a guy called Lonnie Donegan, who played a skiffle, which was called skiffle, very primitive music. Um, Rock Island. But, but, but he, had a, he had a hit record. Rock Island. Rock Island Line. Rock Island Line was, uh, that was very influential as well because all of us 15 year olds were listening to Elvis Presley, were listening to Ronnie Donegan, and this, uh, Ronnie Donegan's music is very simple, three chords, you know, and, and skiffle. So it, it was like everybody had the same idea. Gosh. I could get a guitar, learn three chords, and I'm in a band, you know. <laughs> and so that's what started so many English um, musicians of, of that beat generation play, to actually play music, not just listen to it. So the combination of learning to play guitar and hearing Elvis Presley do Heartbreak Hotel kind of fused together. Did you have his record? Yeah. Elvis's. It's, um, it's fantastic. You know, it, it just made... Um, well, it was the foundation of the British beat, beat boom, you know. The next thing you know, in a few years' time, we were off to America. And um, I can remember being interviewed in America with people saying, now, how did you invent this music? You know, I said, what? Invent this music? It's, it's, it's rock and roll, it's black America, you know, it's blues, jazz, everything that influenced us came from America. When did you notice that you have had become like huge band. Well, the second sing the second single we did was was "Halves of the Rising Sun," and that got to that was number one. I mean, it it was number one about three weeks after release in, in the UK, and then it just went all over the world, you know. And how 
How did you notice, like on a personal level, you know, that oh. what, what changed? It was a life, a life changer, you know, it was a complete, complete life changer, you know. Suddenly we were, I mean, only a few months before, we were just playing a, a, a club in Newcastle, provincial, and then within a very short time, we had a number one record, we were on television, we were famous. <laughs> and then next thing you know, we're jetting off to America, you know, to, to play in Times Square at the Paramount Theatre. I mean, this was crazy in those days, you know. Yeah, tell me when you first arrived in America, because I've, I've read about that, you know, the screaming girls and so on. Yeah. How, what was it? Tell, tell oh, me. The, the craziest thing of all was the first time we arrived in, in New York. Um, the 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 uh, the record company had, had the, you know looking for an angle that, that teamed up with uh, a British car manufacturer uh, who had a, a sports car called the Triumph Tiger. <laughs> so Tiger animals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what happened was we've got through customs and all the rest of it, and then there were five Triumph Tigers lined up, each with a driver, and a model dressed like a, 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 you know, with tiger's whiskers, a basques and fishnet stockings and a, and a tiger's tail. <laughs> and, and we sat up on the, on, on this, the back of the seat, and we, we, each of us with this beautiful model and set off for, for Manhattan with a motorcycle escort each <laughs> time. And it was the first time with the screaming girls, I read. Too, you know, yeah. the, the whole when we when we arrived uh, at our hotel, they were all over the, you know, they were on outside the hotel, you know, and you know, screaming at. We had to rush in, in, indoors, you know, to get inside. And uh, when we got in there, they'd, they'd set up all these interviews with uh, the music press and whatever, you know. But outside, all the girls were on the pavement screaming. And when we, the, the first gigs we played in America were around um, the Paramount Theater and Times Square. And it was uh, it was a strange kind of custom they had in those days, where they, it was a movie and a theater. So they'd show a movie, and then they'd have a live show, and then you'd do that four or five times a day, starting at ten o'clock in the morning till ten o'clock at night. So we um, and and there was um, there were guests, guest uh, guest you know Chuck Berry, um, oh, Del, Del Shannon. Um, quite a few, and all the time, we were in the in the theater, out out on the sidewalk. We had a dressing room, looked look down on the street, and the girls were all, wait, you know, as soon as you looked out the window, they were all screaming. <laughs> it was crazy. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> so that's uh, yeah, that was our first re realization that um, we were now internationally famous. You know. Oh. Um. So we talked about the, 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 all those uh, television shows because television had such an impact back in those oh days yeah. before the internet. Can, can you tell me how, how that worked? You know. And yeah, well, um, it, there were several television shows in, in, the, in the UK to start with. Um, the biggest, most popular one was uh, called Ready, Steady, Go which aired on a, on a Friday evening, and the, the slogan was, the weekend starts here. And it was seven o'clock on a Friday evening for an hour. And... Um, everyone watched it. Oh, everyone, yeah, all the young people, you know. Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the stuff, unlike some shows, uh, it was live, you know? And we were good at live, because they, they, they liked that, so they, they, would, they would have it back often, you know? And it was a live audience, in the, you know, it's a studio audience as well, young kids dancing, um, and it was a very exciting show. Uh, but a anybody who had a single out, you know, all the bands, there were so many of them, uh, all, all after the Beatles, that uh, you had a single in the charts, you automatically, you did Ready, Steady, Go, you did Top of the Pops, you did Thank You, Lucky Stars, um, it was about five major TV shows every week. And you know there was a lot of exposure, and so suddenly, you know you you're not just being seen by the young kids. You see, you're being seen by families. They you become a you become a sort of an international star. <laughs> so, um, 
So I know that there is a connection to, to Jim, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, it's, it's one of your former bass players that, that went in, uh, on to become his manager. Yeah, something. just, just, so, just. So I don't want my question to be, be heard. If, if you want to, if you think it's interesting enough, I mean, everyone thinks yeah. that Jimi Hendrix, since he died so young, is an icon. Well, would, would you want to? Sure. Do you find it interesting enough? Well, I didn't have any personal experience of. of okay, um, so we with, don't have to do that Jimmy one. Uh, so, so uh, well, mm. I, I've <laughs> I read that Eric Burden's first wife, but she went. Uh, she, well, Eric, Eric um, anyway. he, he got he got friendly with uh, with Jimmy as, as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But um, but, but, but those TV shows again, just going back to that. Uh, we, we, that's where we met each other, you know. I mean, the, you'd be on the same show as as the Beatles, as the Rolling Stones, uh, Spencer Davis, the Kinks, the Who. All of the we, we all would be on the same same show, you know. That's how we kind of kept in touch with each other. Yeah. So the Beatles, do you have like a personal memory that you want to share, or like a personal uh, meeting, or any one of those bands? Yeah. Uh, no, it was just um, it was just all friendly, you know. Uh, everybody kept uh, kept uh, you know. Ev everybody knew what everybody else was doing, you know. Your, your latest record, yeah, you would say, "Hey, I like your, you like your latest record. That's terrific," you know. Yeah. That sort of thing it was all very friendly. Do you want to share like a Christmas memory? What first? Of what what will you be doing this Christmas? And also, if you want to share like a you know, because it can be something as small as that it's so nice to come back home and, and do yeah. something very British. So I, I will cut out myself here. So <laughs> um, Christmas for me, well, th this Christmas this year, I'll, I'll be going down to, I, I, I live in the northeast of England, uh, where I originally came from pretty close to. Um, but my daughter, my only child, she uh, lives on the south coast in Hastings. And... Um, my my wife died four years ago. Uh, we've been married for fifty five years, and um, it's hard. Uh, so I bought a flat, in an apartment, down on the south coast. So I live in the northeast, but I've also got an apartment to be near my daughter. Um, so I'll be going down there for Christmas and spending. She's she's great. She's a great cook. She loves music. She's very good. Company, so that, that's. Do you have like a special family tradition that you like to? Uh, not particularly. Just buy each other presents and uh, enjoy a, a meal, a Christmas meal. Um, well, I, I've always, you know, my family were very big on Christmas. The, the whole house was, you know, decorated, and uh, we always had a big turkey, and all the trimmings, and uh, so all, all my life. Christmas has been important family, you know, for families. Uh, so kept, I kept kept that up when, when I became a, a, par a, a husband and a, and a parent. And uh, yeah. so it's, it, Christmas has always been a special time. Yeah. Do you have like a, a, a nice childhood memory of, of Christmas, like uh, where it's been something special that's been very like British or, you know, something that is... Well, one of the most important um, w was when I was just starting to be, you know, got interested in music and playing music. Um, my my parents bought me a, a Grundig tape recorder, so that was that was cool. So when it did, when we started playing with, uh, let me know, Eric in, in the band, um, we we could have rehearsals and, and record what we were doing. And I wish I kept those tapes. 